Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are an amazing God. We thank you that you are an awesome and mighty God. Lord, right out the gates, we just want to rebuke the devil right now. We want to send him back to the pit of hell in the name of Jesus. We want to rebuke and bind him in anything that he wished to do to hinder your word from going forth. Lord, we lift up Bishop and Pastor Kathy right now, Lord. Let this rest time of rest rejuvenate them and revive them. May they come back to us ready to minister to us afresh and anew. Lord, speak to us right now. Give me clear thoughts and articulate words. Lord, allow me to say what only you would have me to say. Lord, if there's anything that's not like you that's in our lives, Lord, we ask you to remove it. Lord, hide it in the small of your back. Cast it into the sea of forgetfulness and remember it no more. Lord, I thank you for what it is you're going to do in and through this service. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When we... When we talk about biblical contributors to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is often the first person that comes to mind. I believe that this has a lot to do with the fact that the Bible contains so much information about the personal life of Paul. We understand his, his transition. We know his testimony, how he lived before his encounter on the road to Damascus. We know about the people, his companions that he ministered with. We, we know about the missionary trips that we went on. And, and we know so much about how he was raised up under Gamal to be a Pharisee. Along with that, we, it is the writing style of Paul that, 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 uh, that attracts us to him. See, his writing style, is, it fits well within our Western mindsets that loves prepositional theology more than narrative theology. We can even witness this in how many evangelical scholars advocate for a method of interpretation that drives a wedge between narrative and teaching, along with history and theology. On top of all of this, the large number of New Testament books that Paul wrote also adds to the reasons why he is often the first writer we think about when we are talking about contributors to the New Testament of the Bible. And there's, there's really nothing wrong with this. We, we should honor Paul for his contribution to the New Testament. We should honor Paul for his labor in the gospel and how he spent his life dedicated to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. But, but there is an unintentional consequence that I, that I want to draw our attention to this evening. See, when we, when we prioritize Paul so much, we, we tend to overlook the contribution of the evangelist Luke. See, while Luke wrote more books in the New Testament, I mean, while Paul wrote more books of the New Testament, Luke actually contributed more material to the New Testament than Paul. Between his, his book of his Gospel of Luke and, and the Acts of the Apostles, those two books together came, contain more material than all of the books that Paul wrote. But see, Luke does not have a flashy testimony like Paul. We don't know much about his personal life or how he came to faith in Jesus Christ, but the unfortunate reality that is in most theological circles, Luke actually stands in the shadow of the Apostle Paul. Bishop talks about this in the preface to his book, The Eight Ministries of the Holy Spirit. Bishop tells us that the tendency to treat the historical narratives and teachings as totally separate and almost irreconcilable has led to the widespread belief that we look to Luke for history and to Paul for theology. Therefore, Luke's history is actually interpreted as though it was written by Paul. So this is the inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired history that, that Luke wrote, but we tend to interpret it as if Paul wrote it. This is, this is very problematic because Luke and Paul wrote from two different theological perspectives and for two different theological purposes. The truth of the matter is, to some degree, this has robbed the church of the unique perspective of the largest portion of New Testament scripture. 
Luke can stand on his own. Luke can stand on his own recognizance. Luke is a theologian and a historian in his own right. Luke's historical narratives are complex works of poetry full of theology that is critical to guiding us in how to live out the gospel in real life situations. These, these messages, they push us towards an ethic that is motivated by the realization that Jesus is for everybody. The, the practical theology of Luke's writings encourage us to be moved with compassion on behalf of the underprivileged and the marginalized. Luke's writing pushes towards a loving balance that exposes and seeks to heal the sins of the individual while also seeking to expose and heal the sins of oppressive systems in our society. Within the cultural milieu of Luke's writing, there is actually an Old Testament prophetic feel as Luke showed us that Jesus came and turned the world upside down. Jesus came and gave a voice to those who had no voice. Jesus affirmed the dignity of those that everyone else thought was trash and garbage. The Bible says that he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to give recovery of sight to the blind, and release to the captives. Luke often challenges us to, to look at the issues in our lives and look at the situations of those around us and understand that because of Jesus Christ, we can do something about what we see. Today we're going to look at one of these instances in the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bible, go with me to Luke 18, and I'll be reading from verse 35 down to verse 43. Luke 18, verse 35 down to verse 43. And here begins the reading of God's word. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For the next few moments, I would like to use for my subject, I want to regain my sight. I want to regain my sight. As we begin to engage this narrative, we first need to deal with some preliminary issues associated with the larger biblical context of this passage. See, when we talk about the larger biblical context, what we are doing is looking at one passage and as it relates to other Old Testament and or New Testament passages. In our case, we need to look at this text in relationship to other passages found within the synoptic gospels of Matthew and Mark. The reason we are doing this is because Matthew and Mark both contain narratives that are very similar to the narrative here found in Luke. Matthew tells us that as Jesus left Jericho, there were two blind men sitting by the road crying, have mercy on me. Mark also tells us that as Jesus left Jericho, there was one blind man named Bartimaeus who sat by the highway side begging and he cried out, son of David. Have mercy on me. And then we now have Luke who tells us that as Jesus approached Jericho, there was a blind man begging by the side of the road saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, to address this, we need to understand that there are a few details we must give some consideration to. 
First, there is the fact that there were actually two cities named Jericho back then. And since Matthew's account gives us a story of two blind men instead of one, we should understand this to mean that Matthew was giving us an account of a completely different event. Secondly, when we look at the difference in the details between Mark and Luke, we need to take into consideration that Mark and Luke are writing their Gospels for different theological purposes. Mark is concerned about showing us the, the amount or the number of miracles that Jesus performed because Mark wants to show us that Jesus was a tireless servant. But Luke is concerned about showing us how Jesus ministered indiscriminately to anyone who was in need. Therefore, these different purposes guided their theological teaching that each author put forth. Consequently, this does not take away from the integrity of this gospel text, but this understanding shows us that we should move forward viewing this narrative as Luke's unique presentation of blind Bartimaeus' healing. As we now zoom in from the broader biblical text, we are now prepared to look at the circumstances of our narrative. Our narrative opens by telling us that as Jesus was approaching with a large crowd, there was a blind man sitting by the road begging. Jesus' earthly ministry at this time is, is drawing to a close. Jesus is actually on his way to Jericho as he makes his way to Jerusalem where he will be arrested on false charges endure a crooked trial, and ultimately be found guilty of being an insurrectionist and sentenced to death by crucifixion. See, people have been hearing the preaching and teaching of Jesus at this point for a few years now. The popularity of Jesus had grown to the point where as Jesus approached Jericho, there is a crowd surrounding Jesus. The Old Testament scholar Kenneth Bailey, who specializes in Hebrew literature and culture, provides us with some additional insight to this passage. Bailey tells us as in Middle Eastern villages to show honor to important guests, the villagers would actually walk some distance out to meet important guests and then walk him or her into the village. At times, the popularity of the guests can be measured by how far out they would go to meet them. To give us a modern day example of this, all we need to do is think back to when the Cleveland Cavaliers won the championship. See, when they won the championship, there was a crowd of people and media from all over the country when that plane touched down at Cleveland Hopkins. Waiting for the champions to return. What we see in our text is very similar to that. Jesus is in the third year of ministry. This is the year of ministry that scholars consider to be his year of opposition. See, his first year was his year of inauguration. His second year was his year of popularity. But now he's in his third year, his year of opposition. There is a shift now taking place in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is still popular, but at the same time, he is met with growing opposition from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Essentially, what this tells us then is that there is a, the crowd surrounding Jesus is actually a mixed multitude. Some people loved Jesus. Other people hated Jesus. But they still were around Jesus. See, for somebody that God has promoted, you need to remind yourself that as you go up, the crowd around you will become a mixed multitude. There will be those that love you, and then there will be haters walking right in step with them. So when the haters start to surface, God just might be promoting your ministry. It is here in the midst of this mixed multitude that we are introduced to our protagonist of this narrative, which is the blind man sitting by the road begging. This blind man hears the crowd and intuitively senses that something must be going on. See, I say that he intuitively senses because the road leading into Jericho was a busy road under normal circumstances. Jericho was the central place for collecting both taxes and customs. It was for collecting customs on grown produce there and for imported produce across the Jordan River. 
Therefore, there was some of everybody traveling in and out of Jericho, living in and around Jericho at this time. There would have been pilgrims from Galilee. There would have been thieves and robbers, Roman soldiers, busy publicans, and there would have been even some priests who were stationed in Jericho. Therefore, hearing a crowd of people on the road leading to Jericho was nothing unusual, especially for a blind man who was on his post begging. Every day he would have been there. So hearing large crowds moving back and forth was nothing unusual, but something, something made this man think that something else must be going on. And intuitively, this blind man began using what he had in the moment to his advantage. See, think about it. The, the, the blind man, he was blind, but he could still hear. He was blind, but he could still talk. See, sometimes we can focus on what we don't have and not even use what we already have to our advantage. When the blind man asked the question in the words of Marvin Gaye, what's going on? He heard the crowd and said, what's going on? And it was here that he learned that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now think about that. If this blind man were more focused on what he lacked than using what he had, he probably would not have asked the question, what's going on? Furthermore, if he did not ask the question, he would not have known that Jesus was passing by and the opportunity for his healing would have come and gone and he would not have even known it. Could it be that Jesus is passing by our situation and our circumstance right now, but we are so focused on what we do not have? Could it be that we are one question away from realizing that Jesus has arrived on the scene of your situation or your circumstances, that he is ready, willing, and able to do a miracle in your life? But when we focus on what we don't have, we can, we can miss it, not understanding that the conditions don't have to be perfect to be right. Amen. The crowd tells the blind man that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And the blind man yells out, son of David, have mercy on me. See, since we are 2,000 years removed from this text, there are some details that we take for granted and overlook sometimes when we read the Bible. See, the crowd tells the blind man that it was Jesus of Nazareth. But the blind man doesn't yell out Jesus of Nazareth. He yells out Jesus, son of David. See, the crowd identified Jesus by where he was born. But the blind man identified Jesus by who he was, which was the son of David. The son of David was a messianic title that spoke to him being the promised Messiah. In calling Jesus the son of David, the blind man was reaching back into the Old Testament and connecting Jesus as the promised anointed one from God. The blind man heard it was Jesus passing by and cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. But the text says as he cried out, the, the crowd told the blind man to shut up. See, they told the blind man to shut up because they didn't understand who Jesus was. But the blind man yelled even more because he knew that Jesus was the son of David. And in fact, the Bible tells us that this blind man's shout caused Jesus to stop in his tracks and tell the crowd to bring the blind man to him. Look at the divine reversal that is beginning to take place in this text. The, the crowd attempts to silence this marginalized blind man, but Jesus gives this man a voice. The same crowd that tried to hinder this blind man, Jesus uses to help 
this blind man. The, the crowd didn't care what was going on with this blind man, but Jesus being moved with compassion, he stops and engages this blind man. And it's here that we arrive at the climax of our narrative found in verse 41, where Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. As usual, we must set aside our 21st century uh, Western perspectives and view this text through the lens of Middle Eastern culture. See, upon closer examination of this text, the initial request of this blind man was for Jesus to extend mercy to him. See, this request for mercy was essentially for a request for Jesus to enter into what was called a client-patron relationship with this blind man. See, clients seek favor from their patron, and favor can be defined as receiving something that could not be obtained any other way. See, the blind man was asking Jesus to do something that he only knew Jesus could do. Everyone else, this blind man, asked for money, but Jesus... He asked for mercy. And in response to the blind man's request for money, Jesus asked this man a seemingly odd question. What do you want me to do for you? It seemed obvious that a, that a man who was blind would, would want his sight, but yet and still Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? See, see, we must remember that when questions are asked in the Bible, it's, it's never just simply a question. What we see here is a positive side of a challenge and repost exchange. We are used to seeing the negative side of this when the Pharisees or the Sadducees would ask Jesus a question trying to question his honor. But here Jesus is challenging this man's request because if Jesus honors his request, it will move this blind man into a new social space. So essentially, Jesus is saying, are you ready for what you're asking for? Are you ready for what you're asking for? See, see, there are times we get ourselves in trouble asking God to give us stuff that we aren't ready for. And then when God doesn't give it to us, we got a problem and an attitude with God. But then when he gives it to us and our lives is all messed up, then we want to get mad at God for giving it to us. We, can, we, we see this when we begin to understand a little bit more of what life would have been like for this blind man. In the traditional Middle Eastern society, beggars were actually recognized as a part of the community and were understood as, as offering services to the community. Every pious person was expected to give to the poor. Therefore, the beggar would sit in public and challenge people saying, Give to God. Give to God. See, they were saying this because they were offering the person an opportunity to fulfill their obligation to God. Then when this public act of generosity to help the beggar, they, they would then get a reputation for being an honorable person. And when the beggar would receive the money, they would then stand up and give loud praises to the person who, who gave them the money. Remember, there's always an audience in the Bible. And there's always this interaction between honor and shame. And, and if something is honorable or shameful, is determined by the reaction of the audience. The challenging part, though, to being a beggar is that to have the best chance of success, a person needed to have a visible handicap. So someone who was deaf or someone who was laying lame, they would have had more of a hard time getting money than someone who was missing a leg or missing an arm or, or even someone who was blind. See, they would, someone who was missing an arm or a leg would, would actually probably be able to sustain themselves by begging. And a person who was blind was actually almost virtually guaranteed being successful at begging. Now, now catch this. this. This gives us a few nuances to consider when we, when we are looking at the situation of this blind man. 
First of all, isn't it, isn't it interesting how societies create systems of public assistance designed to entrap marginalized people, but don't help marginalized people? Along those same lines, if we contextualize this a little further, we see the marginalized existing to serve the needs of those in mainstream society and not the other way around. The cultural norm of, of, of being generous to feel good about yourself and to get a reputation was more important than helping the person in need. In our, in our current society, one example of this would be what is called the benefits cliff. The benefits cliff is a fiscal cliff that people living in poverty have to, have to cross to move from existence to self-sufficiency. See, as a person's income increases, their benefits decrease at a faster pace thereby creating a cliff that they, must, that they must cross so they are making more money and actually have less spending power. In effect, the system is penalizing their progress. So, so when we combine this with the realization that a blind man such as this man would have no education, he would have no training, he would have no employment record, he would have no marketable skills, if he is healed, it would create a difficult time for him to support himself. All of this goes into why Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? In other words, are you sure you want what you are asking me to do? Are you sure you are ready to accept the responsibilities? If I heal you, if I give you this thing, there is a certain responsibility that comes with the blessings of God. This, this blind man, fully aware of what he is saying, answers without hesitation, Lord. I want to regain my sight. Think about that. He didn't say, Lord, I want to see. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. So there was a time when this blind man could see. Therefore, something happened to this blind man that caused him to lose his sight. Uh, blind, blindness is more common than I think we really want to admit. This, this, there's a form of, of blindness that gradually overtakes us. When, when Satan and our sinful proclivities can cause a gradual blindness, our passions and desires can cause a gradual blindness. Trying to please people and not God can cause a gradual blindness. Toxic and abusive relationships relationships we we know who we are before the relationship but after we've been abused and put down for so long it causes gradual blindness uh, uh, addictions can cause gradual blindness something that was supposed to be fun something that we said we would control now is controlling our lives but then there is there are the tragedies in life that can cause sudden blindness. The tragic death of a loved one can cause a sudden blindness. Uh, infidelity in a marriage can cause us to lose our sight. The diagnosis from a doctor can cause us to lose our sight. It was the loss of sight that caused this man to be sitting by the road begging. There is something about blindness that can bring our lives to a grinding halt. No longer certain of anything anymore. At one minute, we, we had everything together. We had a sense of purpose. We had a sense of direction. We felt we knew where God was taking us to go. But then something happens. And we lose our sight and find ourselves sitting by the roadside of life. Blind. 
sitting blind while people are achieving their goals and their dreams. We're sitting blind while people are getting married and promoted. We're sitting blind while people are advancing in what God has called them to do. But, but we're sitting blind. Blindness creates a lack of opportunities. Blindness creates a lack of options. Blindness makes it hard for us to move past what we've always done before. Blindness, it feeds our feelings of hopelessness and despair. It is, it is in this we can see the wisdom of this blind man. He understood the root cause of his situation. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. He knew money wouldn't fix it. Money would just get him something to eat and he would be back there tomorrow. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. He understood that if he could see, that would solve a lot of his problems. The blind man is saying, if, if I could see, I could avoid many of the pitfalls in life. If, if I could see, I could handle what is required of me in this season of life. If, if I can see, I would follow Jesus and I would know his will for my life. If, if I can see, I could see my way clear. I could see my way out of this situation. I believe that that is somebody's prayer in here today. Lord, if I could see. I would know which way to go. I would know what I'm supposed to do. Lord, if I could see. Jesus affirms the blind man and says, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. See, the Bible tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. See, when the blind man couldn't see, he still believed. When, when the man didn't understand, he still believed. When the crowd told him to shut up, he still believed. When Jesus questioned his sincerity, he still believed. Jesus said, blessed are those that believe without seeing. Here is where we often go wrong. We want to see the plan of God before we have faith in the God of the plan. See, we often need to believe that God has a plan in the first place before we can begin to see the plan that God has for our lives. Now, now as we move from the tension of this climactic exchange, we can see the results of Jesus' encounter with this blind man. In verse 33, the Bible says, immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. See, House of the Lord, the, the blindness of this man, it causes me to reflect on the times in my life when the enemy of my soul had blinded my mind. I am reminded when I was, when I was willing to, to sacrifice my calling for the uh, opinions of others and he had blinded my mind. I, I remember when I was considering not even preaching anymore because I felt like the blessings I was preaching about I wasn't seeing in my life. He was blinding my mind. He was blinding my mind to the positive impact my wife was having on my life, not realizing without her love and her influence, I wouldn't even be the man that I, that I am today. He was blinding my mind. I was blind trying to raise my kids, not knowing what was going on, not knowing what to do. He had blinded my mind. And it was here in these moments of darkness and here in these moments of blindness that I had to cry out, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. But see, but see, when I when I cried out, my, my issues were, were telling me to shut up, but but the Holy Spirit empowered me to cry out some more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But 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 then my, my intuitive tape started playing and they started telling me to shut up, but but then the spirit empowered me some more to cry out, Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. 
then, then my pride started telling me to, to shut up, that I, I could figure it out on my own. But the Spirit empowered me to cry out even louder, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. See, see, there, it, is, it is inevitable that, that we, we can't go through this life without experiencing moments of blindness. The, those moments are inevitable. But, but thanks be to God because this text shows us that how we can regain our sight. See, see, here, here is where I want to celebrate the goodness of Jesus. It's in this point of the narrative that praise begins to well up on the inside of me because Jesus stopped by this man's life and did what only Jesus can do. Jesus wasn't even on his way there to see that man, but he cried out and Jesus moved with compassion and did what only he can do. There's been some times in my life where I needed Jesus to do what only he can do. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but, but Jesus, Jesus showed up and did what only he can do. We, we regain our sight by yielding to the Holy Spirit's prompting. We, we regain our sight by accepting the healing that Jesus desires to provide. We, we regain our sight by praising God and uh, aligning ourselves and, and following here. I don't know, is there anybody in here that's had some blindness in your life? Because for anyone reading this text that has experience Jesus restoring their sight understands how amazing this part of the narrative is if you've been in moments of darkness you know how amazing this is I, I've got a praise in my mouth because once I was blind but now I see I've got a praise in my mouth because I once walked in darkness but now I walk in this marvelous light I've got to celebrate Jesus who makes it his business to give recovery of sight to the blind I've got to celebrate Jesus who was anointed by God to give me my sight back I've, I've got to give God some praise that my blindness was only temporary, that it wasn't permanent, but that he sent Jesus as the perfect remedy to give me my sight back. The Bible says it is the Lord who gives sight to the blind. It is the Lord who raises those who are cast down. Somebody ought to praise God in here for giving you your sight. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I... I want to I wanna end a little differently this evening. I want to pray for some people who walked in here blind. I want to pray for somebody who walked in here praying, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Every head bow. If you are in here, and, and this is your prayer, you, you want God to give you your sight back. I want you to stand to your feet so I can pray for you to receive your sight. The Bible says immediately his sight returned to him. You may have walked in here blind, but you don't have to leave here blind. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come to you today and pray that, that everyone who is standing, Lord, that they will receive their sight. Lord, whatever it is that, that has them blind in this moment, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that you will remove it out of their sight. Lord, I pray that they will leave this service with 20-20 with vision in the spirit, Lord. Lord, I pray that they will leave here seeing clear how to walk into what God has destined them to walk in, to walk in the anointing that God has over their life. Lord, I lift them up right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, by faith, 
your word said he received his sight because of his faith. And Lord, we stand here and by faith, we believe and we receive it and we count it as done. In Jesus' name, somebody give him some praise. Ever since, ever since Sunday, the, the devil has been messing with my throat and messing with my voice. And I believe it's because somebody needed that today. And I believe that God was glorified and his will was done today. The devil could not hinder what, what God wanted to happen today. And we praise God for it. I just got a, a few announcements here, and I will be able to let you go.